Dean, when she was only six months old, this little girl, Layla, was diagnosed with a severe type of leukemia. And she was losing the battle. Her team of doctors at Great Ormond Street in London were at the end of their tether. They'd run out of options. They didn't know what else to do. But then one of the members of the team remembered that a French company called Selectus had genetically engineered some specialized blood cells to include a gene that would specifically identify and kill her type of cancer cells. But they couldn't give them to her because they weren't hers to begin with. And these cells would have recognized the cells in her body, all of them, as foreign and attacked. So they got clever and they did a second genome engineering hit, if you will. And they actually broke that recognition gene so that it wouldn't be able to recognize her body as foreign. Six months after receiving that treatment, she was effectively cured of cancer. So this is the, this is the promise, this is the potential of genome engineering, cellular genome engineering. But what role, if any, does it have in Africa? Well, we've got a little idea, but in order to explain that to you, I have to take you back a few hundred thousand years. So I like to think of Africa as the whole box of Smarties. And um, we know that Africa is the cradle of humankind. This is where humans started. This is, it contains the full genetic diversity. But for about 100,000 years ago, a very small fraction of these people migrated out and then subsequently populated the rest of the world. And those who went left of the Caucasus Mountains became Caucasians, what we commonly refer to as now of European descent. The problem is, is that Europeans are largely obviously in Europe and in the States, and that's where most of the drug trials are taking place. Now, drug trials are important. They're important for two main reasons. One, make sure the drug works, pretty much like key. But also, make sure the drug is safe. Make sure it doesn't make you more sick than the disease itself. So, by doing these drug, drug trials on Effectively, just the blue Smarties. We know that those work, but we've got no idea how these drugs impact the rest of the genetic diversity of the world, particularly Africa. How much of an issue is this? How predominant could this be? It's hard to quantify adverse drug reactions, but we think as many as one in 12 people are walking into hospitals in South Africa not because they're sick from the disease, because they're sick from the drugs that they are taking. So if there were 500 people in this room, at any one point you had to go to hospital, 40 of you either have or will have serious adverse reactions. Now I don't really know what it would be like to be diagnosed with something frightening, but I imagine that if I was in the doctor's waiting rooms and I just heard that I'd been diagnosed with breast cancer, I know my doctor's gonna probably say to me, it's okay. There's some good drugs on the market. Um, tamoxifen, we can give you that as a chemotherapeutic, and there's good prognosis, so you should be fine. What about the woman sitting next to me in the waiting room of African descent? She doesn't know if the incredible diversity that she has in her liver genes, liver is crucial to breaking down these, these um, drugs, she doesn't know if her liver is going to be able to break down this drug into the the important component that goes and fights the cancer, number one. She doesn't know if it's gonna work. And two, she doesn't even know if it's safe enough for her to take. She's literally holding her salvation, the salvation to her life in her hands, and she doesn't know if she can take it long enough to beat the cancer. So we have to fix this. It's a crisis. And if we're honest with each other, clinical trials are probably not going to take place across the incredible diaspora that is Africa. But it turns out, we don't actually need a whole human. We can kind of cheat a little bit. And we can actually grow liver cells in a dish, in the lab, sprinkle them with drugs, and investigate what the toxic components are. And we can get a lot of information from that. The problem is, is like, where do I get the liver cells from? So 
basically I need them from you guys and I'd have to sort of slice open most of you. Which is time consuming. <laughs> and expensive. And worse, these liver cells that we take, even though they faithfully mimic what your whole liver would do for the most part, they don't actually live for very long in a dish. So, and we've got another problem as well. I want to be able to compare the difference between Caucasian liver cells and African liver cells, but there are so many genetic variants between all of you. I'm not going to know which mutation is causing which problem. It doesn't help me very much. So we need a solution. And that's where genome engineering and stem cells come in. So what we are actually going to do is synthetically make liver cells ourselves. So I know you all know absolutely everything there is to know about stem cells. <laughs> but this sketch, I think, perfectly explains them rather succinctly. And um, it was done by a chap called Waddington in the 50s. Um, and essentially, if you imagine like the ball at the top of the series of mountains and valleys, and gravity is your only force, you could land up at any one of these different bottoms of the, these different valleys. Um, and that's kind of what a stem cell is. It's at the top of a series of mountain valleys and you can send them down different directions. They can become any cell type we want. But at the top, at the stem cell state, its fate has not yet been determined. We call it cellular fate. And we've learned a lot over the last few decades playing around with these. So we can turn them into brain cells in the dish. Those are quite fun. We make a lot of blood cells, which is also fun. And then occasionally we tinker around with some beating cardiomyocytes. These are super cool, actually, because um, they'll beat like this for a year in a dish when I remember to feed them. And, and, um, and they, when you keep them out of the incubator for too long, they get cold and then they actually slow down. So you can just rapidly move them back into the incubator. So the point being is that we can make any cell type we want. These are very physiologically relevant. But what's the problem we've got here? The problem is that I need an African stem cell to start with. I want the background. So what effectively I've got to do is try and find a way of making that. And a very, very clever guy, Shinya Yamanaka, realized a few years ago that building on an enormous amount of work that others have done, that the DNA of the cells at the bottom is exactly the same as the DNA, the sequence of a stem cell. So we've just got to find a way of reminding a skin cell, for example, that it's a stem cell. And he, with, through extensive work, figured out that there are four genes that you need to add to one of the cells at the bottom to remind that cell that actually wake up the stem cell genes and turn it into a stem cell. But now, it's a little tricky getting genes into cells at the bottom. Yeah, they're very refractive. They don't like being pummeled with DNA. So what, we, what he did was he used a really old school technique that gene therapists use, have been using for decades. And he used a virus. It sounds a little bit dangerous. But essentially, if you think about it, a virus, think about a virus like a tank, OK? It's this incredible vehicle. It can go anywhere. It's also dangerous because it's got all those guns and things like that. So what you want to do is if you removed the guns, you'd still have this amazing vehicle that can get anywhere, can get into anything. And that's what we do with viruses, is we actually de-weaponize them. And then we use them as carriers. So he put his, we call them now the Yamanaka factors, into this virus. And he put these into skin cells. And as a result of that, he was able to push these skin cells back to becoming a stem cell. And he won the Nobel Prize for it in 2012. Talk about decoding greatness. So that's super cool. Now I can make an African stem cell, which is what we've done. And we took one from an African woman because we thought that was the right way to go. And taking a skin biopsy from this person. And by the way, the skin biopsy that you need to take, if any of you are sitting next to someone with a freckle, that's about the size of what you need. And then we use the same procedure that Yaminaka did, turn these into stem cells, and now, because remember you know everything that there is to know about stem cells, we can turn them into anything we want. And we turn them into liver-like cells. 
millions of them, every week. So now we've got our liver cells in a dish. That's great, but the problem is it's only come from one person. And I need to be able to take into account this incredible genetic diversity. I want to be able to test all these mutations. So what do I do? Well, in comes genome engineering. I've heard it described as a, a cut, and, cut and paste of DNA, and essentially that's really what it is. Genome engineering has been going on for decades, but due to the pioneering work of Dunyo and Charpentier at Berkeley, they were able to actually make a really simple genome engineering tool. We call them molecular scissors. And kind of what happens, the way that we do it, is that we make these molecular scissors like CRISPR, and it cuts the DNA at one point, where we've told it to cut. So we've directed it there. So it cuts the DNA, and what happens? Well, the cell freaks. It can't handle it. A double strand break, and the cell's like, it's either gonna kill itself, or it has to repair it as quickly as possible. So, when the repair machinery is coming in, we say to it, don't just, don't just bring back the two little pieces of DNA, don't just fix it like that. Here's a piece of synthetic DNA that I'm giving you. It's got a few changes in it, but I want you to repair that piece just like I've said here. Effectively, barring a few limitations in terms of size, we can change any part of the genome we want to anything we want. So, let me give you an example of something that we're working on now. There's a gene in the liver called CYP2B6, and it's responsible for breaking down drugs. One of the drugs that's responsible for breaking down is a favorins, one of our number one antiretroviral rollout drugs. So, if you've got a G at one particular point in this gene, you're fine. You've got no problem, you'll break down the drug, super cool, that's okay. But if you've got a T, you can't. The side effects from having this one small mutation or taking a favorins are referred to as neuropsychiatric and include suicidal thoughts, catatonia, and psychosis, to name just a few. So that's pretty serious, but how predominant is this mutation? Well, in a small Northern European population, it's at about 15%, so it's not very frequent, and they don't exactly have a high HIV burden. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it approaches 40%. You add that to our HIV burden, and you can start understanding how severe and how much of an impact these adverse drug reactions have on our population. So what we can do now, though, is that I can actually genetically change that G to a T in my liver cells in my dish and I can figure out what's going wrong. I can address that issue of toxicity, find that information, find new drug targets, tweak the drug, so that we can actually provide potentially safer drugs for the population. But we don't just have to do a favorins and this mutation. We can effectively choose any medication that's causing a problem, anti-TB, anti-malarial, cardiovascular, antipsychotic, you name it, any genetic variant drug pair where we think that there's an issue that's prominent in the African population, we can actually test it without slicing any of you up in a lab. And we can do two things with that information. We can provide drug tests, little sequencing tests, so that health practitioners could actually say to their patients, don't take that one, take this one, or just take half the dose of that. And even more importantly, when we work with other scientists, they get this information from these liver cells that we've made, and they can go, I can see what's going wrong. This is no problem. We're just going to remove one little structure of that drug. It's still going to work, but it's going to bypass toxicity. So by using stem cells and genome engineering, we can actually really realistically make safer drugs for the African population. But I would argue, that that's not actually enough. And I don't think Madiba would be particularly pleased with us because we're still playing catch up. We're still adapting to what is given to us by the West. And maybe it's time that we change and challenge that status quo, that we adapt to what is given to us, that we shake up that dogma. Because it all started here. So if we can use genome engineering and stem cells to start leading drug design, yeah. 
we won't just be making safer drugs for the African population. We'd be making them for the rest of the world. <laughs>